Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. First case today, SJC 11906, Public Employee Retirement Administration Commission. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, Paul Hines for the defendant, appellant, Edward uh, Bettencourt. Ne neither the facts nor the procedural history were in dispute in this case, so I plan on devoting my time first to highlighting the uh, points in the district court decision, which I believe uh, demonstrates why it was correct as a matter of law. Uh, next, uh, addressing Parak's arguments with respect to those cases in the other jurisdictions, and then, of course, addressing any questions that the court has. Um, this case demonstrates, uh, in, in the context of Section 15.4, which, uh, as the court knows, limits a review simply to whether or not the criminal offense was related to the office, the duties of the officer position. That's the, the sole issue before the court. This case demonstrates why the Eighth Amendment uh, protections under the excessive fine uh, create that safeguard. Uh, because 15.4 makes no distinction between a misdemeanor or a felony, uh, makes no distinctions between the severity uh, of the criminal activity. Uh, it's, it's simply whether or not a single act that a public employee commits during their entire career will forfeit their pension, which is why the Eighth Amendment uh, analysis is critical and it's, it's mandated. Now, the, um, both, both sides cite the leading case. The uh, U.S. Supreme Court has decided this in the Bajikagian case. And the, uh, they enunciated a three-prong test. Uh, first, whether the forfeiture, uh, the extraction of the forfeiture uh, is a fine. Uh, next, whether it's punitive. Um, and then the, the last uh, part of the test, which we'll probably be devoting a fair amount of time to is whether or not it is grossly disproportionate. Okay. Now, the Bajikasian case, uh, and by the way, uh, obviously the court okay. called for- before you, before you get there, with regard to the US military, if somebody serves honorably for much of his or her time, and then is, commits a crime and is dishonorably discharged, does that person get the military pension upon the conclusion of their of their career, uh, I don't know, Your Honor. Uh, I mean, is this is this akin to a dishonorable discharge? No, no, Your Honor, because because this court, uh, and maybe that is the sort of the segue to jump into these other jurisdictions. The other jurisdictions in question are Oklahoma, uh, Florida, and Pennsylvania. And I think a fair reading of each of the cases that the uh, PARAC has proposed in, in those uh, demonstrates that their pension system and their forfeiture laws are different than Massachusetts. This court, back in 1973, Your Honors, uh, in the opinion of the justices, laid down in the analysis of General Law Chapter 32, Section 25.5, set forth that this, this relationship establishes but, a contractual relationship. That's but this a, is very different, though, from a, b b how do you say it? By, by, <coughs> I can't say it. The, the Bajikagian case. Bajikagian case. I mean, the sense that, that that forfeiture was right in the criminal statute itself. So you're convicted, this goes. I mean, this is, this is among other things, or, or Perak would argue, uh, what's being forfeited here is uh, an expectation. It's over time in the future. It doesn't exist at the time of the crime. So, so, so you're right, I, I, and I get that. And I think what's important from the Bajikagian is sort of the standards that they enunciated for the forfeiture. That uh, in, in that case, the individual forfeited currency. And if you, in the, and I think that in Bajikasian, the court addressed both the, the fine and the punitive aspect 
sort of interchangeable, <coughs> that a forfeiture is a fine. If you forfeit currency, here we're talking about a pension, and it, it's more than an expectation, Your Honor. The a public employee. I mean, is it is it your argument that it's that it's it's every day you work, it's part of what you're receiving? And well, so th that that's part of it, but there, there are certain you you own it at certain points. I mean, a public employee in Mr. Betancourt's case, he commenced employment in or around 1980. So under the Mass Pension Statute, uh, he first vested when he had 10 years of service. You, you vest at 10 years of service, you can leave, you can subsequently retire. Uh, so you own it at that point. You, you certainly own it after you reach, and he retired uh, under superannuation retirement. The requirements, the base requirements for superannuation are age and service. So when he attained 20 years of service, which actually predated the criminal conduct by four years, he, he owned his pension. This court has had numerous cases. Massachusetts, like, unlike these other jurisdictions, treats a pension as property for purposes of a divorce. That when they, in a, in a divorce proceeding and they're doing the domestic relation audit, the, the pension is property. And they calculate the payout at the time of the divorce, notwithstanding the fact that the retirement is going to take place uh, many years later. So, yeah, Your Honor, I, I think that if you read Badgecation, Badgecation, and uh, where they say clearly that the forfeiture of currency, I, I would suggest to you that the forfeiture of a pension that was earned for 28, and if you go back to the sentencing uh, memo from the criminal court, the uh, Superior Court Justice did in fact note that Mr. Betancourt was <coughs> a dedicated public servant for 28 years, uh, a singular <coughs> lapse uh, near the end of his employment is so, what's so, triggered this. So he, so he, at the time of this offense, which was, if I'm rec remembering correctly, December 25th, 2003, is that uh, right? 2004, Your Honor. 2004. So it was 28 years at that point? He had, at the time of his retirement, it's in the record, he had 28 years of uh, accumulated or creditable service for purposes of retirement. Well, e even under contract analysis, um, if isn't this simply a condition uh, that has to be met before the, uh, the, 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 the pension is paid out? The conditions, and there are, there are a number of conditions, you have to work a certain number of years and you have to work without any conviction uh, uh, of, for an offense in the uh, that's connected to your duties to, uh, to the to the, your employment. So, well, so why aren't why isn't it simply a condition precedent? Be, be, because if you look at and I know this court uh, on numerous occasions has referred to Chapter 32 as sort of a, a patchwork or a quilt of all these sections and sub, subsequent amendments, but the the, the core the, the benefits under which he that an employee received their benefits. Section 5 of the retirement law is superannuation. Then there's ordinary and accidental disability. There's a termination allowance. They're, they're the sections that contain, contain the requirements. The requirement for a superannuation retirement is age and years of service. He met those requirements. That goes, Your Honors, to the, uh, to, to the fact that this is a forfeiture. The 15-4 is called a forfeiture. But you, let me just, before you get there, is, you're saying to Justice Fina's question, that's the condition, age and years of service. This for, is not a for condition. For eligibility for the superannuation retirement, or yes. Or entitlement, entitlement to it. To the retirement. So can, and, can, and I, can, that, I, can I ask you, though, is this, <clears throat> is the basis of your argument that this crime was so petty or is it that if it were a more serious crime, would you be arguing the same thing? Well, so I think we're jumping to the uh, the excessive fine, Your Honor. The well, no, I, I'm, it, the I'm trying to figure out. Are you, are you continuing to argue, as the Peabody Board found, that this was not, for example, criminal activity in the course of his official duties? No, no, but that will come up, Your Honor, in the public trust because that's that, that's. The you, public trust. You public. would say whatever the crime is, it's still a forfeiture, and then the question is whether it's too excessive. It's still a fine, as defined in the Eighth Amendment. 
whatever the crime is, and then the, 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 the factual question becomes, is it excessive or not? That's Correct, Your Honor. So what, he, he earned it. He was eligible under Section 5. And then uh, the literal application of 15.4 is they, they, the court found that he violated the laws applicable to his position, and he forfeited that pension. Now, under the excessive fine argument, there are additional criteria that need to be discussed. And I think, in, in, with respect to Justice Cordy's question, I think a starting off point in this case is where the SJC left off in the McLean case and, and noted that, in referring to McLean, that this is not a case involving a minor infraction involving a few thousand dollars resulting in the loss of hundreds of thousand dollars of pension benefits. That is this case, Your Honor. That, yeah. is, that is this case. But, but as to the first question, McLean assumed for purposes of the decision that it was a fine. It didn't get into whether it was a fine or not. Correct, Your Honor, and that's why I believe you sought the amicus briefs, and, and I, I realized that the issue that this court is now grappling with, because you assumed for uh, the case, you know, the sake of those other cases, that the, the fine, and it was punitive, that on those facts, in the Flaherty case, in the Ma case, and the McLean case, that it was not grossly disproportionate because of the amount of sort of bad conduct involved versus the loss of that pension. In this case, uh, I think when we get to that point that the gross uh, disproportionality dispropor is clearly evident, which is why uh, I wanted to focus on the fine. And I think the Bajikagian case, and it's been briefed by both sides, I think Bajikagian uh, clearly uh, supports the conclusion that it, it is a fine uh, and it is punitive. And yeah, it, therefore, it, we get to the gross disproportion, the excessive fine analysis. In, in, in evaluating the excessive fine analysis, is it all or nothing? That is, do we, we do, or do we look to see how much of the pension could be forfeited for it not to be excessive? Well, so, you know, and, and that's one. No, I think the, uh, the test that, that's been laid out in Bajikasian, Your Honor, uh, sort of three, there, there are three criteria that you look at. So you look at the amount of the forfeiture, and um, then you look at the degree of culpability, which includes the nature of the offense and also the consideration of the maximum penalties that uh, could have been applied. And then you look, the third would be the harm cause. This is my reading of Bajikagian, the harm cause. Harm cause to victims, harm cause to the public fisc, and harm cause to the public trust. But my question is a bit different. Could, could, could one say, even if one were to agree with your position, that a partial forfeiture may not be excessive? That one could still have oh, uh, a reduction in the pension the, the, by 50% or 75% and that that would fall below the excessive line? No, I, I think what the Bajikasian <coughs> case said that uh, even if uh, a statute, even if the forfeiture is in part punitive or if uh, it meets the standard, but I, d the, I don't believe that the court uh, clearly, could uh, the court under the 15-4 analysis, you can't prorate. The law didn't provide for that to say that a public employee who did 30 years of commendable service and committed one bad act at the end of their career uh, should be entitled to, you know, a prorated pension, which would be substantially their pension. It, it is all or nothing. That if well, well, but is that I didn't Vajikajian leave that question open because the because Mr. Bajikajian didn't cross appeal? In other words, the district court, if I'm remembering right, the di district court imposed a $15,000 fine, and then the Court of Appeals reversed and said, no, it's the whole thing, and then the Supreme Court, I thought, affirmed the district court, because there had not been an appeal with respect to the 15000 But in, in Bajikajian? Yes. But I, I took uh, the Chief Justice's question in this case as whether or not the, the Massachusetts, whether this court could sort of prorate or award a partial benefit, if I understood it correctly. Right. The question was basically, you can say, okay, well, taking the whole thing away is excessive, but taking half away would not be excessive. And you say well, no, that oh, we can't do that. 
So, well, that goes into the analysis, Your Honor. I don't think, I think in the, um, I don't think it's strictly a quantitative analysis. It's a qualitative analysis based on those criteria that I, that I set forth. And in this, uh, in this case, Your Honor, the, uh, there's really not a dispute between the parties on the, well, there's not a material dispute on the amount of the forfeiture. It's, it's in the briefs. The, the Commonwealth says it's $659,000. We calculate it higher. It also includes health insurance benefits, which this court noted in McLean is, is an integral part of a person's retirement allowance. So uh, we, don't, we don't dispute that. Where we are in dispute is on the uh, consideration of the maximum penalties. In this case, Your Honors, it was probably the lowest form of misdemeanor. Uh, you know, it was 21 counts of the same offense of going on to the computer. And each of those had a maximum fine of up to $1,000 or 30 days in prison, um, or both. The actual fine imposed was $10,500 in one year of unsupervised uh, probation. All right. Well, thank you. I think your time is up. Okay. Thank you so much. Good morning, Your Honors. Peter Sachs, State Solicitor for PERAC, and with me at council table is Judith Corrigan, Deputy General Counsel for PERAC. Section 15.4 does not result in any fine, let alone an excessive fine under the Eighth Amendment, because Section 15.4 doesn't cause any payment to the government. Rather, oh, the only payment- That's not right. right. Go ahead. Um, even if you don't dwell on the expected benefit, the statute basically says that there is to be no interest. No interest. And I, that, of course, <clears throat> is a benefit to the government without question. Um, I think it depends on how, whether. Of many years of having contributed money um, without earning anything on it. That is, I think, a part of it that is itself fine like and punitive. One can certainly um, debate whether the uh, interest on that money is property that belongs to Mr. Betancourt or not. Assuming it is, for the moment, um, I will say that it doesn't raise an excessiveness uh, issue because of the rather infinitesimal interest rates that's that are paid. That's a different question, though. That doesn't tell you whether it's a fine or not. No, that's true. That's correct. We, we acknowledge that. that. For the sake of interest. Well. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt no. you. No. No, I'm sorry, I just didn't hear the last portion of your question. Well, my, this, this relates to Justice Lang's question. Yeah. But, uh, 15.6 says that if you, if you're any member, uh, any, if a member's final conviction of an offense results in a forfeiture of rights under this chapter, which would include 15.4, the member um, shall forfeit and the board shall require the member yes. to repay <clears throat> all benefits received after the date of the offense. Yes. So that is taking money away. 15.6 would raise a different scenario. However, 15.6 was enacted in 2011 and applies only to retirements after April 2nd of 2012. Well, so it doesn't apply to this case. And it, I concede it, that it, that would result in, in some cases, in a payment back to the government of benefits that one had received after the commission of the offense, um, but before the conviction. But, but that's a different case. Well, doesn't it, though, go to how one should interpret the statute and what the legislature's <coughs> intent was, what it was meant as punishment. I mean, doesn't that go to whether it is a forfeiture of that results in, uh, under Bajikagian, a fine? There are a number of different sections, subsections of Section 15, Your Honor, and each of them functions differently. Uh, sections 15.1 and 15.3 provide for a payment uh, of restitution uh, for misappropriation of funds. Section 15.3a results in a forfeiture of the member's deductions, um, which we would acknowledge does constitute a payment to the government. Section 15.4, which is at issue here, uh, results in a payment by the government back to Mr. Betancourt of his accumulated deductions. We argue that that is not a fine. 15.6 
in some circumstances could result in a payment back to the government by the member of the benefits received in the meantime. So I don't think one can look at Section 15 as a whole and make generalizations about what the legislature's purpose was because each subsection serves a, a different purpose and results in different payments going in one direction or but, another. But here, we do have the interest section that is applicable. We have the... And so it's not just the benefits that he will not be getting. It's the interest he's also had taken from. Yes, if, we're, if one were to consider the interest here as a punitive fine, and I th um, think there are reasons not to consider it punitive, um, but if one were to um, assume, as one did, in, as this court did in McLean, that prongs one and two of the Bajikagian analysis are satisfied, and then look at whether it's grossly disproportional. There's no information in the record about the amount of the interest, but I can say that looking at Mr. Uh, Betancourt had 28 years of service in the system. I can say that looking at my own recent retirement statement from the State Retirement Board with 27 years in, my accumulated interest was $16,000. So one would have to conclude that $16,000 was an excessive fine. you would just take the part of it as opposed to just deciding whether or not the entire statute section that applies to him is itself a fine. I don't know that you can parse it that finely. Well, <clears throat> what, um, what 15.4 results in is a payment back to the member of his accumulated deductions without interest. So if you're looking at what portion of that constitutes a fine, if any, it would have to be the interest. The interest, although again it's not shown in the record, would be in the neighborhood of let's say $20,000, and then this court would have to look at whether that payment is grossly disproportional to the gravity of Mr. Betancourt's 21 offenses. Why, and we would contend that it's not. Look, why wouldn't you look at what was the, what does the statute mean as a whole? I don't, how do you parse it that way? Uh, one looks at the operation of the statute and whether it works a fine uh, or forfeiture uh, under the Eighth, eighth what, Amendment. What the United States Supreme Court talked about was what, even in part. Um, when the Supreme Court said even in part, they were talking about the purpose of the payment. And, and they said that if the purpose is punitive in part, then, uh, the, then the payment is subject to Eighth Amendment analysis. But they didn't say that if the purpose of the um, is punitive in part, then you look at all amounts that are going in either direction uh, under the statute as fines necessarily. Mr. Bajikajian was in a very different position. He was carrying $357,000 in cash that he owned, possessed, was physically carrying out of the country. Um, and he forfeited that. That was his property. Here, Mr. Betancourt uh, is uh, suffering the loss of an expected payment stream that was always statutorily contingent on his not being convicted of crimes while in office. Uh, my brother referred to Mr. Betancourt having a vested right in these benefits. Uh, it's not vested because under Section 25.5, which in the opinion of the justices that was cited, is the um, portion of Chapter 32 that creates a contractual relationship between the member and the retirement system. Section 25.5 says that the provisions of sections 1 through 28 inclusive shall form a contractual relationship between the member and the retirement system. And sections 1 through 28 inclusive include section 15.4, which is a condition precedent to receiving a retirement allowance in the same way that uh, accumulating a certain number of years of service and making your required contributions are uh, conditions precedent. So the occurrence of that condition precedent and the loss of the benefit that's expected does not constitute a loss of property or anything that Mr. Betancourt owned. Do you acknowledge that uh, in some circumstances the law recognizes pension benefits as property, for example, in the divorce context? Yes. So why is it not property? Uh, because those pension benefits um, are subject to, uh, I'm not sure whether Your Honor is talking about Pension benefits in the public context or benefit pension benefits in the public context? In the public context. Uh, they may be property, but as I understand it, and this isn't well developed in the record, it's mentioned in the amicus brief of the Coalition of Police that um, pension benefits can be divided upon divorce as a, a, a marital asset. Uh, but my understanding is that those domestic relations orders are always contingent uh, on the actual receipt of the uh, benefit. They can't divide up something that the uh, spouse doesn't own. 
And the question here is whether Mr. Betancourt owns that expected future stream of benefits. 15.4 makes that payment, makes those benefits contingent on his remaining free of misconduct in office, and our contention, therefore, is that he did not own that amount. Even if one were to view the um, loss of these benefits as uh, a fine, um, it is not punishment for some offense, which is the second prong of Bajikagian. Rather, it is a consequence of uh, the breach of his pension contract. And I'm coming at this a little bit differently than we did in the brief, because I've reread some of the cases from the other states that we cite, and many of them adopt this analysis. Um, it's not punishment for an offense. It is the consequence of the employee's breach of the pension contract to which he constructively agreed when he became a public employee. With, with this, this court, just last year, I believe, talked about 15-4 as punitive in nature. I mean, I'm not sure that we saw this as contractual in Garney. Did uh, Garney did refer to pensions as property, Your Honor. But, but the issue in Garney. To section 32, section 15 involves the forfeiture of property. It is penal in nature. We but draw its limits narrowly. That's, that's correct, Your Honor, but neither the punitive nature of uh, or not of Section 15.4 nor whether it involves po property has ever been squarely decided by the court. I acknowledge those comments in Garney, but those were dictum because the issue in Garney was whether, uh, was what sorts of offenses trigger Section 15.4, not what the constitutional implications of 15.4 are. In that case, uh, a teacher was convicted of possessing child pornography, but it had no connection to his office or position, and so the court held that uh, Section 15.4 did not apply. But Garney didn't resolve any of the questions that are before the court today. Can I ask you, and I don't know if this is part of the record, but uh, if the result that you're arguing for is, is upheld, uh, or if we decide that, that you're right, is there any obligation on the part of the defendant to pay retroactively into the Social Security system? Uh, that is not shown in the record, and I don't believe, based on my limited understanding of Social Security, that there would be any such obligation. Now, the defendant may have private employment. I know that he was the uh, owner, along with his wife, of a um, driving school in Peabody. Uh, I don't know what the arrangement was there, whether he was considered an employee of the school or what private employment um, subject to Social Security he may have had before he became a public employee. But I don't, uh, I'm not aware of any provision of the Social Security laws that would require him to make an additional payment to Social Security. Why isn't the loss of, of um, his expectation for a pension in these circumstances after 28 years um, of, of all conceivable, gov at least governmental retirement, uh, including Social Security, why isn't the loss of that uh, uh, effectively a penalty? It, it is a significant loss, but it's the loss of an expectation. And it's not a penalty because it's a um, the occurrence of a contingency to which he constructively agreed when he became a public employee. And this court recognized that in the McLean case when it said when McLean became a public employee, uh, he uh, uh, was aware of the conditions of Section 15 that uh, would subject him to pension forfeiture if he committed certain offenses but, and that but those became you agree a. agree that McLean left open didn't, in fact, yes. it assumed that it was a fine. Yes, and, and we would urge the court to resolve the question left open in McLean because uh, if the court does not resolve this first prong uh, issue of badge occasion, then courts will have to go on analyzing whether a particular fine is grossly disproportional to the gravity of the offense. And that is a difficult inquiry. Uh, badge occasion sets up a number of factors to be considered. This court has recognized them and applied them in the McLean case, in the Maher case. The appeals court applied them in the Flaherty case. Uh, lower courts have continued to apply them. And no court other than the court here uh, the district court here has actually found that a fine is grossly, grossly disproportional to the gravity of the offense. But I think we have to acknowledge, and this court said in the um, uh, McLean case, I'm sorry, uh, the uh, Maher case, this court said, quoting Bajikajian, any judicial determination of the gravity of a criminal offense is inherently imprecise. So as long as as prongs one and two of Bajikajian 
whether it's a fine and whether it's punitive, remain unresolved, then courts will uh, have to go on resolving this somewhat subjective determination of whether a fine is grossly disproportional. If the court resolves either prong or prong two in favor of the government's position, then courts will not have to engage in that uh, analysis. I just ask a follow-up question about something you raised, um, not fully explored, the question of whether in another context, say divorce, this pension is property, and you suggested perhaps that maybe it would be contingent on actual receipt pursuant to an order that would divide it between two uh, spouses. So uh, carrying that forward, you're suggesting then it would, if you're correct, that parties who divided their home and their other assets um, in expectation that they would receive it. So let's say it's the wife who's receiving the expectation. She loses this non-property as well under your analysis since it's not really property but an expectation in this case if Mr. Bettencourt actually had been uh, divorced and his wife was entitled to his half. She just doesn't get it because she, that's your understanding? Yes, that's correct. And if it because, the, because the receipt by Mr. Bettencourt is always contingent on the um, satisfaction of 15 fourths condition not being convicted of an uh, offense related to one's office or position. And I take it that there's no authority for um, a reduced pension as a... There is not in 15-4 as it exists now. There is in the statutes of some other states. So if, if, if we were to, to say it is a fine, you would say it's all or nothing? Yes. Yes, did, that's what the statute provides. Did, did you... And maybe I, did, Do you agree that in Bajikajian itself, it seems to be that the federal district court that was affirmed had actually figured out what would be an appropriate, w wouldn't be excessive? I'll, I'll have to defer to Your Honor's reading of Badger Cajun no, because I've read. No, I could be wrong. I could definitely uh, be no, wrong. No, I, I don't question it at all. I focus so much on the legal discussion that I've probably skipped over the, the facts now. But it may well be that there was some discretion there. I, it, it seems to me the statute may have required the forfeiture of all of the uh, amount of cash that was being carried out of the, uh, the country without being reported, but, uh, but I'm not certain. But, but I don't think there's any dispute between the parties here that 15-4, as it's written, says, in no event shall any member receive any retirement benefit. So there's no provision for adjusting the amount depending on whether a retirement board or a court uh, thinks uh, the full amount is grossly disproportional, but some lesser amount would be appropriate. So the legislature has made it an all or nothing question. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you.